Fena To the living God No one can deny That Jesus Christ Okay, so last week we started a brand new series on love. We, we've come out of the pain of, of detoxing and, and looking at examining ourselves and, and figuring out things that we need to get out of our system. And now we're moving into love, right? As we begin to look at the scripture, Paul says that love is the absolute most important thing that we can master. If we, if we want to focus on one thing, and I know during this time in the Corinthian church, there was so much focus on gifts, you know, on speaking in tongues, on healing and all these wonderful things. Uh, and what Paul does right in the middle of teaching on gifting, he pauses for a second. He gets off of the spiritual gifts highway and gets on the side street called love. And we're going to spend probably the better of eight weeks really looking at what it means to love, because Paul says that if we want to do anything right, anything in life, it all starts with our ability to love. And, and he says basically in the beginning of chapter 13, if we want anything to matter in our lives, this is what we talked about last week, it requires us to start with love. If we want to do anything right, if we want to have any lasting value, if we want to have any legacy, if we want to have any spiritual gift, no spiritual gift, this is what Paul says, means anything, anything, if we don't know how to love. And just like the video said, God is the example for what it means to have love because he unconditionally loves us. Listen, how many of you know in your heart that you don't deserve what God is doing for you in your life. That, that there was some people in class that worked a little bit harder, that, that there was a little bit more focus, that you made some mistakes that would have, you know, thank God that life isn't battleship, right? You made some mistakes that found you that should have sunk your battleship. Your game should have been over. But, but God is good, isn't he? And he loves us unconditionally and, and what Paul begins to say if we want to be Christians and want to represent Christ in this world if we want to do anything that matters in our life then we have to start with loving loving like Christ because we'll never be able to love like God but but we can always look at the example of sacrifice uh, the example of putting others first the examples of serving within Jesus life and so what I want to do is I want to focus uh, probably for the next eight weeks on loving like Christ, loving like Jesus. And we get through this series, we will be ready for gifts and, and for taking care of each other and for doing all kind of big things. But we all have to start in this one place together with love. T today I want to talk with you from the topic, love is patient. Don't everybody smile at once. I know in a microwave world where you can cook a turkey in, in, in six hours, right? In the microwave, something that used to take overnight to do that is very hard to kind of understand this concept of patience, right? I get up in the morning uh, and instead of me having to brew a whole pot of coffee and get out, you know, the beans and do all these different things and, and get the water measured and all that stuff, I take my cup, I put a pot in, and some of the best coffee I can get is in my cup. It, it takes two minutes. It's amazing. And, and so much of our life is built around this concept of, of quick, fast, in a hurry. And, and we begin to think, you know what? I, I'm not patient enough because my life is not patient enough because, because I need it quick. I need it fast. And I want to stop you for a second. I, as I've been studying patience, I learned one thing. And one thing, one thing that's very powerful about patience and that is, patience doesn't have anything to do with time. Nothing at all. Because see, when you love somebody, it doesn't matter how much time it takes to cook for them, 
to go and do stuff for them. It doesn't matter. Time doesn't mean anything when you truly, truly love somebody. See, see, we have used patience and this new definition of time as the excuse to get us out of really addressing the issue. We don't have a time issue. You're not too busy. You don't have too much to do. We have a love issue. But what we've done is we place some things higher in our love spectrum than other things. And because I can be doing this other thing that I love more than you, hallelujah, I'm impatient with you. It doesn't have anything to do with time because you remember what it was like when you were dating married folk. Time, there was no such thing as time. You know what it's like when you are, you know, out doing that thing that you really like to do, the thing that potentially the service today may be standing in the way of. You know, you check your clock, you check your clock, you check your clock because when I want to do something, time is not enough. There's not enough time to do it. And when we start to put the right things in the right order, we don't have to worry about how long we stay in service. We can worship all day long. Paul tells a story about a man. They worship all day long. The man passed out. He was asleep, fell down, died. Paul went and saved his life, brought him back from the dead. He got back up and started back to worshiping. But, but the reason why a service may seem too long is because you, you got some love somewhere else and something else that, that, that you want to do. See, what patience tells us more than anything else is how much we value the object that is in front of us. That's what it tells us. It tells us whether we really, really, really value the thing that we're impatient with. That's what it's about. I, I, hate, I hate to tell you that because it is so easy for us to be able to think that it's all about, I've got not enough time, not enough, what, I got 25, I need 25 hours in a day, I need eight days a week in order to do all the stuff that I need to do, but for those things that you love most, and you learn how to be patient. Uh, let me read some scripture to you real quick. Starting first, this will be the anchor scripture for our series. We'll get really good in this because this, this scripture, Paul teaches us more in this scripture about love than, than, than is contained in the entire Bible. In all the books on Amazon and love, Paul teaches everything that you need to know in these first three scriptures of, of Corinthians chapter 13. He says, if, if I speak human or angelic languages, but do not have love, if I have this ability where I can, I can just speak in any language that I want to speak into, but I don't have love, I am a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. That's it. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all the mysteries and all knowledge and, and if I have all faith so that I can move a mountain, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. He says, and, and if I donate all my goods to feed the poor, take everything, 401k, everything, and I just donate it, give it away so that I can just get that money and go and feed the poor. And if I give my body in order to boast but do not have love, if I'm willing to just allow myself to be martyred, to be killed, but I'm not doing it for love, we don't get anything. It's worthless. When love is not involved and what Paul began to teach us, and if you didn't get a chance to see the sermon from last week, you should go back and watch it. What Paul is teaching us is in order for anything to matter in your life or to have any lasting value in your life, you need to understand that love has to be the center of it. If it's not about love, it won't last. And like I told you last week, you've got some things that people have paid hundreds of dollars for thousands of dollars for it, inside of a closet somewhere. Some of you is in a landfill somewhere. It means nothing to you. But you got something that your daughter made you when she was in grade school that is completely worthless. And it's on your refrigerator right now. Because love means everything. Love is the only thing that matters. And what Paul does is he uses a new word for love. Now, check this out. He uses this word agape, agape. 
And this word is a word that explains unconditional love. Because see, the Greeks, they spoke differently than we did. We use one word, love. It's the same word we use for toilet tissue, the same word we use for mama, the same word we use for frat brother, the same word we use for dog, the same word we use for a car or an object. We say love, one word. But what the Greeks did, they used multiple words. There are four words within the Bible that are used for love. And what Paul does is he carefully chooses this word. Now I want you to check out this word agape. It's rarely ever used in any other Greek literature. It is rarely used in the Old Testament. The only time it's used in the Old Testament is when it talks about God. It's never used when it's talking about us as people loving each other. Paul used it almost 300 times in the, in the New Testament to explain what it means to love like Christ. 300 times. He uses it over and over and over again. He could have choose, choose words like uh, philia which means like a brotherly love. That's where the city of Philadelphia's name comes from. He could have used arrows, you know, that's the uh, 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 Cupid love associated with Valentine's Day. He could have used storge. That's a word that's closer to what we would say for, you know, loving a dog or loving toilet tissue or something like that. But when you're talking about something that you are willing to sell everything for, I don't care how good your toilet tissue is. You're not going to sell everything for it. And then about what you're going to buy a whole lot of toilet tissue. Where, you gonna, where would you put all that toilet tissue if you bought it? And so what Paul wants to do is he wants to teach us by using this word that is rarely used. And this word means unconditional love. Listen, it is love is Mary J. Block. Love without limits. No limits. You can't make enough mistakes to make me stop loving you. You can't hurt me enough to make me turn away from you. It is the love that, listen, Jesus Christ had. It is the same love that allowed him to go up on a cross and die for sinners like us. It is a love Amen. that only can be described by the word agape. And Paul uses this word over and over again. And if we want to love like Jesus, we've got to learn how to love unconditionally. We've got to learn how to be agape lovers, right? And what Paul does is, instead of defining agape, because he knew 2,000 years later, we potentially be here trying to figure out, you know, definitions and schematics and all that kind of stuff. And and in trying to figure out, you know, what does agape mean and what does this guy says it mean? What does this guy say it mean? What have you? And Webster wasn't around at this time. And so what Paul does is instead of writing out this is what love is, he begins to give us a total of 14 characteristics, seven positive ones. Seven negative ones, so there's no question, right? If you, if you have any confusion, Paul has already figured it all out for you. And he starts with the first one, and that's where we're going to start today. Paul says, in the A part of verse 4, he says, love is patient. Love is patient. And he uses a word that does have some time element to it, but not in the way that we think about it. It doesn't have anything to do with like, I need something quick. I need you to, you know, come on in, get out of here. It doesn't have anything to do with that. But he uses this word, Macroth Umio. Macroth Umio. I think that's close enough. And, and what this word means in the Greek, it takes these two Greek words and it puts these two Greek words together. And basically what it comes down to is long macro, long suffering. See, what patience is about, it's not about how quick you can get to the next thing, but it's about how long you can stay with somebody when they've let you down, when they've hurt you over and over again. It's about how long you can suffer. That is what love is about. Love is not about how many things you can do in a day and how many places you can go and how much multitasking you can do and how many different activities you can get the kids in and how many different things you and the husband can do and singles, how many different places you can go and prove how much you love each other and be around and all that stuff. He said, no. 
Love is about when you suffer with a person when they're going through the hardest part of their life. Will you long suffer when their actions are hurting you? When you look at them and you say, the reason why I am in this very situation that I'm in is not because of mistakes that I made. I'm suffering because of you, but I love you anyway. It's, 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 will you forbear? Will you, will you go through some stuff? I'm talking about when you get that late night telephone call and it's one of the kids and they've done the thing over and over and over again. Will you get out of bed? Go down there again and get them out one more time. Will you forgive them again? Will you, will you stand beside them even though they've hurt you, even though you told them, listen, if you do this again, I'm not going to be there to bail you. I'm not going to help you. I'm not going to give you another, another check. I'm not going to give you another whatever. And then they still do it. Uh, loves, it suffers through that. I came across this definition. It was within the Matthew Henry's commentary. I just want to read it to you because it's so rich and it explains so much of what it means to be patient. It says that patience can endure evil, injury, and provocation. Do you know what provocation is? It's when somebody did something on purpose to make you mad. I'm purposely doing this because I want you angry. I want you to feel my hurt. I want to take you through something. And that is the reason why I did this. And patience endures that. It endures evil. It endures injury. You hurt me on purpose or not on purpose, but I'm still going to be there. And I'm still going to love you because I am patient with you. It says without, without being Filled with resentment. Now, this is the this is the part I want you to get because it says that not only will it endure this evil and and this injury and this provocation, but but it'll do it without getting resentful, without without bitterness. You know what I'm trying to say? You you hurt me. You wrong me. I'm not gonna hold that against you. I'm not gonna get bitter with you. I'm not gonna treat you in a way. Why? Cause I, cause I love you. It endures, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't cause you to have to go through any kind of revenge. I'm, I'm not going to fix you. You did this to, get to me. Now I'm going to go out and do this thing to you. Do you know what a marriage is like with revenge? They got a word for it. Divorce. That, that's what it is. When you get to a place in your life and it's all about making the other person feel what you went through, you are on your path toward divorce. When you're in sibling relationships and it's all about resentment and you hold on to stuff, rightfully stuff. That's, a, that's the amazing part about this word resentment is that you probably are justified in feeling the way you feel. I, I'm not here. I'm sure if, if I brought you up here and you sat down and you explained to us exactly what they did to you, I'm sure you'd be so justified. All of us in here would be crying. This is not about justification because patience goes past justification. Patience says that the value that I have in this relationship, the value I have in you, my sister, the value I have in you, my brother, the value I have in you, my husband, the value I have in you, my wife, the value I have in you, my parent, the value I have in you, my child, the value I have in you, my church member. That, that it is so great that I'm willing to endure, to be patient, to not be resentful, to not try to get revenge. He says, it will put up with many slights. How many of you have been slighted before? How many of you have been slighted before? Folk put you down, said angry, mean, nasty, hateful things to you. It's amazing the types of things I'm talking about folk who love you. I'm not talking about, you don't care nothing about them jokers out there that don't love you. It's those people that are closest to you, that are beyond your, your, your armor, that are, are right next to you, that say things, that slight you, that hurt you, that injure you the most. How many of you, you know what it feels like to, to, to be neglected from a person who loves you? He says that it will put up with, with many slights, 
and neglects from the person it loves and wait long, not, not just for a few days, not just for a few hours, not even just for a few months, sometimes it may be years before your patience even begins to show up in the person that you're being patient to. And that is the definition of patience. It doesn't have anything to do with, with, with your time, with what all you got on your schedule. It doesn't have anything to do with that. It's all about how much you love somebody. It's all about the agape, got paid that you have inside of your heart for the person. And if the agape that you have inside of your heart is strong enough, you will be patient. Now, now, now let me check you for a second. Let me tell you what patience is not because I, we've gotten all confused. One of the enemy's biggest tri tricks is to always kind of get us to thinking about stuff wrong, right? Thinking about it a little different. Think about what he does to Eve in the garden. He just basically bends the truth a little bit bends definitions a little bit and he makes you think about things and so let me just tell you real quick what patience is not because I don't want you walking out of here doing the wrong thing just trying to show somebody that you love them that I got agape love so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take no action at all I'm going to be I'm, it's inaction right that's not what patience is patience is not about you doing nothing at all Patience is not about you ignoring somebody, amen? I'm just going to ignore them. I'm going to show them my agape love. Just think about what I'm saying. I'm going to show somebody my agape love by ignoring them. You know, I can't even get it out. It, 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 it's, it's not irresponsibility. It's not you allowing somebody to do something that will probably hurt themselves just so you can prove to them or to me or to you that you're patient. And what God did, it's amazing how God works in my life. He took me back all the way back to Stone Mountain when our kids were like eight and, and, and five. And we went up to Stone Mountain uh, just outside of Charlotte. And, and I wanted to be a trusting and patient father. But I got an eight-year-old and five-year-old. And, and so what I did was to the best of my ability, I allowed them to play as close to the edge, and I tried even much closer to the edge than I was comfortable with, be honest with you. They were way close for me, way close, and way, way close for a shocker. But I was saying to Shaki, let's just be patient. Let's let them try to figure it out. But, but it got to a point where I had to come and step in. I had to perform some type of action. I tried to ignore them playing so that it wouldn't hurt me and kill me and make me impatient and everything. But they crossed that point. And it was my responsibility to step in. And so what I want to get you to understand, being patient has nothing to do with you sitting back and letting somebody go down the wrong path or fall off a spiritual cliff. Being patient is not about inaction. Patient is powerful. There is a such thing as righteous indignation. When you see something going on and it is your responsibility to step in and stop it. Now, you got to understand that because if we don't understand that, we will believe that being patient, agape type of patience is all about not saying something when you know you ought to say something, about ignoring somebody when you know you ought to act, about allowing somebody to make some kind of mistake that can hurt themselves so that you can say, I was patient with you. So, so, so this is what I want to do. I want to take this word patient. Now that we've got it defined, now that we understand what patience is, I want to put it back inside of the, those three scriptures and I want to talk about them. Let's look at them real quick. First of all, in verse one, it says, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but do not have patience. I, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And what Paul is saying is that without patience, nothing I say matters. It doesn't matter how eloquent I can speak. It doesn't matter if I can speak in different languages. It doesn't matter what I'm saying. If I'm not patient enough to listen to you, 
If I'm not patient enough to at least think about you, to at least uh, allow for my comments to make sense to you, if every time you get ready to talk, I'm not patient enough to be quiet and allow you to get your thoughts out, I'm just a loud gong. Without patience, nothing I say is matters to anybody. Nobody listens to somebody who's not patient enough to listen to them. And what Paul showed us, shows us is that with patience, everything, everything I say matters. Everything I say matters. Look at 1 Thessalonians. He says, and we exhort you. This is Paul talking to the church. This is Paul talking to us today. He says, I exhort you, all of you. Brothers, he says, warn those. You got you to gotta speak to those who are irresponsible. Comfort the discouraged. Help the weak. Look at the end of it, he says, but be patient with, with everyone. And what Paul exhorts us today, listen, he says, you've got to do some things with your mouth. There are some words that you need to use, but those words have got to matter. And the only way that those words are going to matter is that you use agape love patience. You've got to be patient with everybody, even when you are correct. Listen, it's so okay. people, listen, people are not against correction. It's never been about what you say. It's always been about how you say it. Children are not against, they just want to know what's the right thing to do. But we've got to be able to communicate that husbands, wives, siblings to each other in a patient, loving, agape way. And when we're able to do that, everything that we say matters. Let's go a little bit further. Verse two, he says, if, if I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so that I can move mountains, I can move mountains with my faith, but do not have patience, I am nothing. And what Paul says, without patience, nothing I know matters. If I'm not patient enough to understand the need of my knowledge from the person standing in front of me, I'm just talking to them about stuff that doesn't even make a difference. Have you ever sat down and received advice from somebody who didn't even listen to your question? Because they knew your issue. They knew what they needed to tell you before you could even finish your request. And without even listening to you, they go on and they're so wise and so they have, they're eloquent in their words and so wise. They have so much wisdom. Have you ever had somebody try and give you faith without being patient? Let me cry for a second. Let, let me tell you what's hurting me. Let me let me tell you what's bothering me before you dive into the Bible and start throwing scriptures at me. How helpful is that to you when somebody comes to you and tries to use their knowledge without love? It's, it's worthless, right? But, 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 but let's look at this. He says, with patience, everything I know matters. When, when you're patient and you listen to people and you're able to connect with that knowledge from God, everything you know, look what he says in Proverbs 19, 11, he says, a person's wisdom yields patience. It is the one's glory to overlook an offense. First of all, when, when, when you're patient, you, you, you're paying attention to what's really going on. You've got wisdom going on in the situation. You're not being offended by the small things that are coming out of nowhere, out of left field, out of right field, because a person is hurting and you can make a difference that matters when you use patience with your wisdom. Let's look at the final verse. He says, if I, if I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But, but if I do not have patience, think about that. I'm, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to sell all my stuff. He says, I would gain nothing. And what Paul teaches us today, 2,000 years later, he says, without patience, nothing I give matters. 
If I'm not patient, it doesn't matter, right? And I looked at this verse in James, and I'm using this a little bit out of context, but I want to tell you how I'm using it out of context, because what Paul is saying, what James is even saying, is that with patience, everything I give matters. And what, what, what they're talking about in the context of this verse is waiting on Jesus. But as I read the verse, I began to see something that will help us out today. He says, therefore, brothers, be patient until the Lord's coming. He uses this example. He says, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also must be patient. And I, I begin to think about that. that. That whole analogy of the farmer says so much about patience because the first thing you have to be able to do when you're talking about giving patiently, you need to sow your seed on fertile ground. But, but you also need to be able to, when you're giving patiently, sow your seed on fertile ground, understanding that you don't have control over what you're giving away. When you put that seed into fertile ground, you're dependent on rain to come. You, 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 you've got to wait some time. It's a period of time. You don't plant a seed, pour water on it, and eat fruit the next day. And when we give in that way, first of all, when we don't give in the fertile ground, we just give just to be able to give, right? We're not giving in, in patience. We're not thinking about that process of planting the seed. When we give and we expect to receive something and we let them know, hey, I gave this to you, but you never. When we give and we don't patiently wait for the thing that we gave to take its full manifestation, you can't give to somebody one day and expect them to be completely out of debt the next day. And what Paul says is when we give from the right place, when we put it on fertile ground, when we understand the principles that it's bigger than our gifts. You know, Robert Lyons says all the time, we might sow the seed, somebody else might water the seed. That's Paul, right? But it's up to God to get the glory from that seed. That's the, the final piece of understanding what it means to give patiently. It's not about what you get back at all. It's about God's glory. It's about how God can use your seed to make a difference in somebody else's life. That's what it's about. That's how you give patiently. So, so how do we become how do we become patient? I want to just walk you through a few things. How do we become patient? First of all, you need to understand the process and the purpose of patience. You need to understand why why God created this this whole thing called patience. I want to read this verse to you. It says, we can rejoice. Everybody get excited because whenever he says we can rejoice, we ought to be ready. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. He says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they are good for us, your problems and your trials, the very thing you came in this church praying for today, the very thing you've been going through, the thing you've been staying up at night about is good for you. He says they they help us learn to what? Be patient. Now, 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 now check this out because it goes way deep. I'm gonna, we're going to go way deeper than that because understanding the purpose of patience is not in, it doesn't end here because you wouldn't get enough out of this. You wouldn't want to go through some of the stuff you're going through now just so you can be patient. Matter of fact, you probably say, listen, I don't have to be patient. I'm good not being patient. <laughs> take, this, take this thing away from me, this, this thorn out my side, whatever it is. I, I, I can go without some patience, right? But, but, but check this out, what, what happens with this patience. And patience develop strength of character in us and helps us trust God more each time we use it until finally our hope and faith are strong and steady. That's what, that's what patience is doing in your life. It's building character in you, your patience. Every time you go through a situation and you don't fly off the, the hook, you don't run away, you don't give up, you, you keep going forward, you remain patient, you suffer long, you forbear. God is using that situation to develop your character. He's making a difference. You ain't the same person you, that you've been through. You don't look like what you've been through. First of all, let me just tell you that. Some of you guys have been through some real long suffering. Some real forbearing. You lost some stuff. You hurt. 
So, so you don't look like what you've been through. I can tell you that right now because I see saints in front of me. You don't look like what you've been through. But what God is doing is, is he's building this character inside of you. That, that's why you got all that wisdom. That's why you're able to help so many people through your pain. He, he helps us get closer to him, trust him more. That's what happens to your patience. He says, finally, your hope and your faith grow strong and steady. You're not like that, that boat that, that's on the waves that's being rocked side to side. Every time a wave hits you, you get knocked to the left. And another wave hits you, you get knocked to the right. But you are steady. How many of you have, see, I, I, I'm going to say this. How many of you have a, a grandmother that was steady in her faith? How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? A grandfather, a mother, a, a, a husband, a wife, somebody that's steady in their faith. You understand what I'm trying to say? The way that they got to be steady in their faith that we believe what the Bible tells us is through patience. The whole time they were going through the things that they were going through, and sometimes we can't even see their story. We just know them to be steady, right? But, but the reality is that they've been through some stuff in order to get to a place where they become so patient and their patience lead, leads to the steadiness. Let's go a little bit further. It says, then... When that happens, Paul's still going now. He says, we are able to hold our heads high no matter what. Mm -hmm. Through patience, you get to a place where you, you can say, you know what, I did everything I can do. I, I can hold my head up no matter what happens and know that all is well. Hallelujah. For we know how dearly God loves us. And we feel this warm love every way. And this word for love that he's using here, agape. He says that our patience gets us to a place where we experience the love of God like we never could have experienced. That you had to go through what you went through in order for you to experience the love of God. In order for you to experience the agape love of God, you had to go through it. You would have never known God the way you know him if it wasn't for this situation that moved you into the realm of agape. You're in a new place in your love for God because of this situation. He says not only uh, did, did it move you into the realm, but, but it made it to where you love. You feel it on the inside. You know, it's all inside of you, the Holy Spirit. You feel it. He has filled your heart with what? Agape love is his agape love. That's how you get it. And that's the benefit. That's, that's what it's really about. That's what patience is really about. It's getting you to a place where you can truly experience agape love from God and you can truly give agape love. Because until you've endured patiently, you, you don't even know what agape love is. So, so the first thing you got to do is you got to understand the purpose of patience. Then we need to understand the big picture. We'll go back to this Proverbs verse. A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. The second thing that you got to do after you kind of understand the purpose of patience is you need to get wise about the big picture. You know what? You fly off too much. I don't even know you like this, but I'm telling you. You fly off too much. You fly off way too much because you lack wisdom. And if you were just a little bit wiser, you could control yourself. But because you don't understand, because you don't take the time to use agape level wisdom to really look at somebody and be patient with them and understand that the only reason that anybody would behave the way that they're behaving is because they are hurt. Nobody wants to treat you that way. Nobody wants to hurt you. Nobody wants to, 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 to cause you issues or cause you problems. And it takes wisdom from God. You have to pray, God, make me wise. Help me to be able to understand what is hurting this person. Help me to be able to understand how I can be used to help this person. Help me, God, to have wisdom in every situation so whenever I encounter somebody, I can give them agape love. That's what I want to do. I want to give them agape love. I don't want to fly off. I want to understand the big picture. I want to understand how this conversation with this lady is going to save a life in the future. That's what I want to understand. Your big picture, your big plan, how you're using me 
in your big plan. And when you understand how you fit into the big plan, you can become much more patient. But it's that fear, it's that confusion when you don't understand exactly how I fit into this puzzle. You know, am I in the right place now? Am I doing the right thing? Am I with the right person? It's that lack of wisdom that causes us not to be patient. We start acting irrationally. We start moving around, doing stuff that we have no business. We start selling for some things that we have no business selling for because we lack wisdom. And so we need to understand the purpose. We need to pray for wisdom in every situation so that we may be, be patient, so that we may love like Jesus. And then the final thing is, you just need to understand Jesus' power. You were not born with patience. You will not pray patience into your life. You will not say, I'm going to be more patient tomorrow and do four or five things and be patient. It is impossible. You were born crying. Impatiently. Give me something to eat. Change me right now. Pick me up. Hold me. Rock me to sleep. Play my song. Smile when I smile. And when you, you're not born patient, it is not a natural characteristic. You're not, you're not gonna get it, you're not gonna pick it up. You're not, just cause you got saved. You know that, you've been treated impatiently by saved people all your whole life. Being saved is not gonna give you patience. 12 steps, not gonna give you patience. A book on patience, not gonna give you patience and you probably won't have the time to read it. But the only thing that can give you patience is truly tapping into the love, the agape love and power of Jesus Christ. You have to constantly be reaching out to Christ. God, act in me. Come inside of me. Help me, God. Show me your agape love. Show me instances in my life where I've experienced your agape love. See, this is what we mess up at, right? We forget what folk were at agape love for us. When, when somebody else comes up and needs the exact same agape love, right? We forget about the person that was patient with us, that loved us, that spent the extra time with us, that held us, that stayed with us. We forget all that when the person comes up and make a mistake. We expect for them to be what we are, parents. Now. We expect for our children to be where we are, making decisions like we make now, and we still make decisions that will make our own parents impatient with us, right? That's right. I'm gonna go back to this, to, the, to this verse in Romans 5 and 5, because I want you guys to understand this, that there is, there is power in loving patiently. But there's enough power in loving patiently to fix whatever wrongs you have in any relationship in your life. That there's not a marriage that can't be fixed with just a little bit more patient love. There's not a relationship between children and parents that can't be fixed. Just a little bit more patient love. That there's not a work situation. There's no no relationship, period, that can't be fixed with just a little bit more patience. And I want to be careful. I want to be careful with this because I don't want you to think for one second that I'm telling you to go out of here and ignore the person in your life that you love in order to be more patient, you know? I'm not telling you to allow them to make mistakes in order that you can be able to, to feel like you're being more patient. What I'm telling you to do is to just love them. What I'm telling you to do is to recognize that the person across from you, whether it is a husband, a wife, whether it is a child, a sibling, whether it is a co-worker, a neighbor, whether it is somebody from a different political party, a racist, a killer, what, what, what I'm telling you is, is that 
You have to get to a place as Christians where we love like Christ and Christ's love is patient and it doesn't see color. It doesn't see sex. It doesn't see uh, uh, any types of demographics. It doesn't poll because it's, it's just neutral. It just sees everything the same way. It's no, you can't do a poll against it. And what I'm trying to tell you is if we get to a place where we would just love patiently, look at all this stuff that Paul promises. He says that we will get to a place in our lives where we can keep our head up no matter what. How many of you guys want to be in a place in your marriage where you can say or in your in a relationship, no matter who is with, where you can keep your head up and say, hey, I, was, I did everything I'm supposed to do. I'm patient. I suffered long with you. I forbeared. Everything that we said in front of all those people, I'm talking to married folk right now. Everything we said in front of God and all those people, I held up to in sickness and health and to death do, do us part. All that stuff. But what about with a sibling, guys? Don't you want to be able to hold your head up and say, even though things are not right with my parents or not right with my children or not right with my sister or whatever the case may be, I can say that I was patient, that I love patient. I can hold my head up high because I know that once I love patiently, it's all in God's hands. And I understand that God is using this situation in order to bring me closer to him, I can, I can celebrate because I'm getting ready to enter into an agape level love with God like I've never experienced before. Every time God takes me through this situation that requires me to be patient, I know that he's setting me up for this agape love that's going to follow it. I know that when I walk out of this situation, that I'll be able to love like my grandma loved. I bet it love like fill in the blank, that person that you admire, that person that loves you unconditionally. It didn't matter what you sat down and told them, it didn't matter what mistakes you made in the past, that I will be able to love like Jesus, like a savior who made a choice. Listen, to patiently love you. He said, the, the only way that I can deal with this person that's in front of me, fill in the blank, you, 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 me, all of us, is that I be so patient with them that I am willing to allow for my life to be taken. People are going to beat me. And listen, I will have the ability to end my suffering, right? I, I could snap my finger and everybody around me would just fall dead. But, but I'm going to patiently allow for them to whip me with that cat of nine tails. They're going to rip the blood out of my back, all the skin out of my back. I'm going to patiently walk and carry my cross. I could easily, I could make him, I could do Jedi mind trick, right? I could make two or three of them come carry it for me. But I'm going to patiently pull this all the way to the place where they're going to kill me. Folk are going to spit on me. And instead of me going off, and I don't know anybody who likes being spat on, I think most of us would rather have our backs beat out than to be spat on, right? Folk are going to spit in my face. But I'm going to be patient for you because I love you with a level of agape love that you may never understand. They're going to they're take a stick. They're going to hit me over and over with that stick. They're going to call me names. Now think about how many times you lost your patience over somebody calling you a name. But Jesus has been beaten, spat on, been hit with a stick. All that happened before the first name got called. And he still patiently goes up on that cross. And, and I'm going to sit in hell and and dead in this tomb for three days patiently. I could have kicked the door open on day one. But I'm going to patiently love Uplift Church and all the people in it and all the Christians throughout the world and even the sinners who may not ever come to Christ. 
I'm going to love each and every one of them with this agape level patience, man. And I'm willing to die and I'm willing to trust that one day I'm going to come out of this grave. And when I come out of the grave, I'm going to continue to love them with patience. I'm going to allow you to make all kind of mistakes. Listen, think about all the mistakes you made. I'm not talking about before you guys say I'm talking about think about all the mistakes that you made since you've been saved. But Jesus keeps forgiving you with his agape patience. He keeps picking you up no matter how many times you fall down. He keeps standing you back up. He keeps forgiving you, keeps getting you out of situations. He keeps moving on your behalf. He keeps taking care of your children. He keeps providing for you. He suffers long with you. With his agape, patient love. And all he asks in return is that we would love like him, is that we would, would put God into a, a godly place in our heart where God becomes, no matter what he doesn't give you, I still love you, God. No matter what I take from you, I still love you, God. No matter what prayer I don't answer, I still love you, God. And if we're honest with ourselves, we don't always love God with, a, with an agape love. It's, it's pretty agape when we get what we want. But we don't get what we want. Boy, we showed up, go to a, uh, a Arab, a filial, or some other kind of love, don't it? A store gay love, you know? Put God on, on the shelf for a little while because he didn't give us what we wanted. I, I want you just to think about this. Get ready to go to our final thought. How different is your life going to be now that you're loving with patient agape. Agape. How, how different is your marriage going to be? If you love each other patiently. And don't worry about married folk. Listen to me. Don't worry about what the other person is going to do. Love them. That's what love does. It, it, it bears. It's forbearing. It, 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 it suffers. Even when the other person doesn't do it. And, and it waits patiently on the day. When that other person said, and I've been there, I've been at bedside when that person said to the person, I was wrong all those years. I've, I've had the conversations where the person said, that was worth every day that I, did, I didn't walk away. Agape patience. So, so this week, I want you just to think about this. Everything, everything will matter in my life because I will love patiently like Jesus Christ. Everything, your whole life is, is taking on new meaning. Your marriage right now, I'm talking to somebody, is taking on new meaning. Your relationships with siblings, with kids right now, taking on new meanings because you're learning how to love patiently. Imagine what your ministry is going to be like. I'm talking to somebody. Your ministry is going to a new level today. Because you're learning how to patiently love people. And folk that you would have pushed away with all your knowledge and folk that you would have pushed away with all your fancy words and folk you would have pushed away. I heard Jason talking about his, he went down and, and met with, uh, uh, with, with, with Carter, President Carter. And he was talking about how people didn't really identify him until they figured out that he was just a regular person. He was an old farmer, peanut farmer. It, it, it's amazing how when we begin to love patiently and we begin to become real to people, the impact of our ministry, the impact that we can have on other folk. Some folk, listen, ministers, I'm talking about ministers now. Some folk won't even listen to us because they think we know too much. They think we judge too much. They think we got too much to say. They think we look down too much. But when we're able to be patient enough to understand what their concerns are, what they really struggle with, what difference we really can make in their life, when we give them that agape, patient love, our ministries grow. Our impact grows. And, and so this week, I just want you you focus on this thought of loving patiently like Jesus Christ. And I just want you just to pay attention. As you love like Christ, patiently, the difference that he makes in every aspect of your life. To God be the glory.
listening Living God, to the living God, no one can deny, no one can deny that Jesus Christ. That Jesus